Okay, good morning. I am, uh, I decided to do the Flint water crisis today because uh, we've got a visiting scholar and he, he um, or visiting faculty from France and we were talking about Flint, Flint water yesterday a bit um, and uh, he decided he'd, he'd like to just come, come to class. Um, so he's, he's on his way, but a little bit delayed. So um, he's gonna join uh, in a little bit. So after class, you can meet uh, Dr. Jeff Wallace-Sage. And so I figured I'd also uh, talk about the Flint water crisis. Um, how many of you feel like you know what it's about? A little bit. I, I, I forget sometimes, like, did, did you ever take my 3110 class? You did, okay, so maybe you had it there this, this session. Okay, so sorry, will be a little bit of a repeat from that. Um, yeah, and, and sometimes there's a, has been a few updates to like the legal outfall, so, um, but I think for, for most everybody, it'll be a little bit new, and regardless, I think that with what we've learned in this class, we might connect a little better and say, oh, hey, this is, this is that um, precipitation reaction occurring or the dissolution reaction, so. Um, so that's, that's what I'm gonna do today. I'm also uh, experimenting with some new, uh, new sound quality stuff. I know that the, since using this mic compared to my webcam mic, my voice comes through clearer, but very quiet. And so I'm trying to adjust that. Well, looks like it's doing all right, but we'll see on the uh, recording later. Okay, so with, with that, um, I last kind of logistics announcement, I've not, developed your last homework yet, but I'll be working on that uh, today. Hopefully I can get that to you today, but um, it might be might be tomorrow if not. Um, and that'll be due a week from uh, today. So it won't be, qu probably won't be quite as involved as past homework since we are pushing the, the limit of <laughs> the, re the remaining technical uh, lectures left, which would be about one. Um, okay, so uh, what happened in Flint? Uh, first of all, where is Flint? I've got this little uh, picture of Michigan there, but I figure we can also hop over to um, Google Maps here. Um, so in 2014, I was finishing my PhD and I ended up moving to Lansing here, which is the capital of Michigan. Uh, Flint is just northeast of it, um, right here. Uh, as a um, bit of reference point, Detroit is southeast, um, maybe an hour drive of, of Flint. Um, there's a, a town called Saginaw to the north and um, a, an area right here where there were some plans to take water from Lake Huron. Um, so those will be relevant, relevant features here. And then there's also the Flint River um, which flows through right here. Okay, so that's uh, that's Flint. That's this is Michigan. It's the little glove. If Louisiana is the boot, Michigan is the the mitt or the glove. Um, and as a reference, I, I grew up north northern Georgia near Atlanta. Uh, moved there and then have been in Louisiana since. Okay, so that's a a bit of orientation about where we're talking about. Um, well, what actually happened, there were several crises. Now, we, we often hear about it as the Flint water crisis. Um, and that would generally be referring to the lead in drinking water, which is obviously terrible um, and a massive concern for many reasons. Um, but in addition to that, there was also a Legionnaire's outbreak um, that was uh, largely related. They also had um, I mentioned this last time, but their uh, water treatment capacity was not um, not up to up to the task of the changes, and so they ended up having several scenarios where they were treating water insufficiently and sending water that had high coliform counts out into the distribution system. So that would trigger boil water advisories to say, "Hey, the water's not safe. You should boil it before you drink it." Um, in conjunction with that, when they, the, that would happen during the summer when the bacterial counts were high in the river. So the incoming water was high in, in bacteria, so the chlorination was not quite sufficient. 
So then they're sending water with too many bacteria. And once, once they realize that, which as you may know by now, to count the bacteria, you have to wait it for them to incubate. So you wait, wait a day, then you get your results. And then you're like, oh, wait, let's take back that water we just sent out a day ago. That, that, that doesn't work, right? So you have to, um, as soon as you have that information, you send out the boil water advisory, the water's already in the pipes and that's no good. So as they ramped up their chlorination in these hot uh, summer months where there was a lot of bacteria, then they're forming a lot of trihalomethanes, um, disinfection byproducts generally. And so then they're getting in trouble for that. So they're trying to cut back on the chlorine, but then they're having too many bacteria counts. So it was a big mess. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but the, the major things would be the lead and the Legionnaire's disease. Uh, there's a, a couple of really uh, strong articles that describe the technical aspects of the Flint water crisis um, by a faculty at Virginia Tech um, by the name of Mark Edwards. His group was a, a big part of recognizing, quantifying, and, and demonstrating scientifically the, the issue here. So the, there's a, um, one of the papers here. He also has a, an excellent lecture um, and has a lot more insight on the um, dynamics or, and or failures of, uh, in terms of dynamics with regards to the EPA and different agencies that should have, could have been more proactive in all of this. Okay, so what I wanna do is kind of walk through a timeline. Just describe kind of what happened, um, tell it as a story, so to speak. So um, really, if we wanna understand why we even had lead in the pipes and why this is a, a problem that was uh, possible, we have to go way back to 1900s, we, where we were routinely putting lead in our pipes, right? So lead in the pipes means that, uh, or, or was used for pipes because it was pretty convenient. Um, it was easy to work with. If you've ever um, taken a lead fishing weight or something, you can see you could, you could mold it a little bit even with your hands. Like it's malleable enough, but it will also be reasonably solid. So it's very convenient for the, um, how easy it is to work with and you can make, you could make pipes or, or at least seal pipes solder them together, things like that, um, relatively easily. Good morning. And so we used to use lead in our pipes, right? That, that was pretty common. In fact, if you go back to um, Roman days, that the reason lead is known as PB um, comes from the same Latin root that we get plumber, right? The, the PB and plumber is coming from the same, same exact source. Right, it's, it's that, that Latin. So it's been used for a long time. This is actually also why um, I think in the 1700s, people thought pewter, uh, or no, excuse me, um, they thought tomatoes when they first came to the Americas, they thought tomatoes were poisonous because what would happen is it would, uh, the acidity would leach the lead out of pewter dishes. And, and so then people would get lead poisoning from eating a lot of tomatoes on their dishes that had some lead in it. <laughs> um, so we, we eventually learned that, yeah, lead, lead is not so good. Um, now, in pipes, there's still plenty of places that, with older plumbing that have lead in the pipes. And that, that should not be a problem as long as we have corrosion control. So as long as we're not eating tomatoes off of those pipes, right, essentially. Um, okay, but that, that was the thing. We don't do that anymore, but we do have ways to, um, ways to handle that that are supposed to be in place. Now, the other piece of context here is between the 1930s and 60s, Flint, Michigan had an auto industry boom. Um, and, you know, I'm just going to take a, a moment to come back here um, to the map just as a, a quick reminder now that everybody's here. Um, Michigan's up here. Uh, Lansing's here where I spent a couple years. That's where I had my postdoc and first had a chance to go to France. Um, Dr. Lesage back there. Um, Flint, Michigan is a, about an hour or so drive east and north of, of Lansing. Okay, so 
that whole area was undergoing an auto industry boom. Um, during that time, huge growth in population, lots of industry, lots of metalworking, lots of um, uh, auto industry and all sorts of related industries. So this is a large population um, kind of explosion. That means there's a lot more homes, that means there's infrastructure for a large population. Uh, and so then fast forward a little bit, when it collapses, then you have a recipe for economic depression um, uh, in a kind of localized manner. So this would, this would give us the, the name of the Rust Belt. You know, we have like the, in the southern states, we would call it the Bible Belt. The northern states became known as the Rust Belt because all this steel and auto and um, metalworking industries uh, as, as we sent them overseas or um, just became less and less uh, industrial, this, um, this was a severe collapse. And so then there's lots and lots of people um, that used to have jobs and now don't have any jobs. So anybody that could afford to may move somewhere that had jobs, right? And so then the people that are left uh, don't have so many jobs. And the entire region struggled, and Flint as in particular was... Um, was really, really harmed by this. So then the pop this, this time increased the population and then the 1960s and, and after really was a decrease in population. Um, so maybe I can draw that a little better. So it was kind of a boom and a bust. Uh, so that means that once we, we have many, many houses, a big water distribution system, all of this, and then half the people leave or more then there become some, some real big challenges with maintaining the infrastructure for that area because it, you're maintaining it based on presumably local tax dollars or at least a, a large part of that. And so then if you have only a fraction of your people still living in the area and those ones are probably the ones that can't really afford to get away, um, then you have a real, uh, a real severe issue of no ability to support the infrastructure that should be there, okay? So that's uh, that was tragic. Um, it got to the point that um, there were, the, the state of Michigan was doing revenue sharing across different cities. So if, if Detroit was doing a little better for a while, it would be sending some of its money to the other cities. Um, and as we might, as you might know, Detroit has not been doing so well. So it was more like maybe like Grand Rapids or something was doing a little better off, there would be a revenue sharing program where their tax dollars were being used to support Flint or Detroit or other, um, other uh, municipalities um, to help cover these costs. Now, in the, the first decade of the 2000s, um, the state government uh, gradually stopped this revenue sharing program. Um, it had been in place for some time and they decided, you know, this is not fair. And if, if you stop and think about it, there's, there's a lot here, right? You can say to yourself, wow, this is not fair. Why would you take this money away with people, the impoverished people really need this? On the flip side, you can also say, wow, you're, you're taking people's money and spending it for somebody else. Like, that's also not fair. Um, so it, I'm, not, I'm not here to, to prescribe a, the right solution, um, but just to say that it was not a good situation, right, in, in a lot of ways. Um, and so at, at this level, I can understand the motivations to share it and to push against sharing it uh, because at some point you don't want a, you know, like, like an individual, you wouldn't want an individual um, in your life, you know, taking things for granted or, or not, you know, just, you know, being, being taking, taking, taking and, and, and all that. You wouldn't want that to happen in, um, in the situation either. So it, it makes some sense to me, but it's very, very difficult. All right, so um, in 2011, the problem really starts coming into focus. So in 2011, the state start, uh, appointed an emergency manager to handle the finances of Flint, Michigan, because they were defaulting on a lot of their um, obligations. So they weren't able to pay um, the cost to keep their city running. Obviously, they used to have help, and now they don't have help. And so um, that 
presents a big challenge. So as they are starting to go bankrupt, um, the state decides, well, if you're not able to manage your finances on your own, we're going to an, appoint an unelected person to go and do that for you because somebody else has to do it, obviously, is, is what their, um, uh, I guess their perspective was. And these are, the, the key thing here is this is, these are not, not elected. These are just appointed by that, the governor and they're not necessarily from Flint, right? So they don't actually have um, Flint's a, a deep knowledge about what's going on locally. Um, so in theory, having somebody else make the difficult decisions might be helpful, but as we'll see, this has just been an utter disaster um, to taking these actions. Okay, so in 2013, uh, there's an emergency manager um, in charge that decides that um, while they had been taking water from the Detroit water and sewerage system, maybe that's not such a good idea anymore. And what they ought to do instead is switch and use their own water system. Um, and that's where um, they were interested in taking from uh, essentially Lake Huron. There was some, some work happening uh, so they had been taking water from Detroit and there was pipes heading up and uh, going there. Then I think it was Saginaw was starting a project on their own and they were gonna piggyback on top of that to get water, a water um, source supply piped from Lake Huron um, from this area, I believe was the plan. Um, and so they, they started formalizing that plan and with all of this, their, their theory was, hey, we can, we can probably save about, um, I think it was $5 million um, based on the, the cost difference because they were paying Detroit um, over the course of several years. Um, so this was, their aim was to save, say $5 million over a few years. Okay, so that, that makes some sense why they would want to do that. Um, then also in 2013, the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department hears of these plans and kind of gives, gets kind of angry that they were gonna terminate their contract or making plans, I guess maybe behind the back. And so, you know, they, uh, they end up giving Flint a one year termination notice. Say, well, okay, if you're gonna do this, um, and I think uh, Detroit's uh, water and sewerage, um, you know, we could point some blame at them for being sort of, for, uh, I guess, being ugly about it is, is the impression I get. But a one year notice, you know, maybe that was, maybe that was the terms of the contract. Um, but at any rate, that doesn't give Flint enough time to complete the projects that they had planned. Um, so they have to scramble um, and in, also in 2013, they realize um, their renovation is going to take too long, so they are going to um, have to shift, and they ultimately decide to use the Flint River water temporarily. Now, at this time, Flint, Michigan had a small water treatment plant that was really designed to take the water they were purchasing from Detroit and touch it up mostly at that point, they were just adding a little more chlorine to keep the chlorine residuals where they needed to be, um, and then distributing it. Because the water they were purchasing from Detroit was already treated. So it was primarily not being used for much. Um, I think it was a, an older system before, maybe from before they were doing, um, getting water from Detroit. Um, so it was, uh, it was able to do a little bit, and that, that's what they plan to do. So they, they go for it in April 2014. They decide um, to use the Flint River for their water supply. And a key thing that really they ultimately overlooked was the Flint River water was much more corrosive. Uh, coming back to our um, ORP discussions, right? Um, the, it was much more corrosive than the Detroit water and sewerage stuff. In fact, Detroit was adding corrosion control. Um, so corrosion control would be what we would say orthophosphate or just simply 
phosphate, right? Some sort of phosphoric acid. Uh, adding a little bit of that stabilizes, um, it uh, reduces the corrosivity, and it stabilizes in particular um, different metals against, uh, it kind of passivates the, them a bit. So essentially corrosion control is as simple as adding phosphate. Um, okay, so they, uh, they, here's their, their major, major failing was they did not add corrosion control. This would have been a very, very simple step, injecting a chemical <laughs> in a known amount and sending it along, right? So this is a, um, so Flint failed to add it. Uh, or add corrosion control. Let's say failed to control. Okay, and that was an engineering oversight, essentially. So if you're gonna uh, point any fingers, um, it, it's not clear if this was an engineer who just didn't see it, or if maybe there was an engineer somewhere who reviewed it, did all the stuff, and told the manager, um, and they said, no, it's too expensive, right? We, d we don't know how this happened exactly, um, maybe maybe that's in, in court processes, but we do know this is a massive engineering failure, right? That um, was a disaster, or, or as we'll as we'll see. Okay, um, so that's really what I would call the start of the Flint water crises, um, and the one we know in terms of lead. That's the, that's the one we, we think of, and that's the, the really the instigating source. Okay, so immediately, as soon as this switch happens, still in 2014, Flint, Flint's residents start complaining. It's like, hey, this water is awful. It tastes bad, it smells bad, it looks bad. Um, this, what, what's wrong with this? Um, and uh, understandably uh, agitated about that. In August 2014, um, this is where those high coliform counts I was talking about came in. Uh, August in Michigan is, you know, the, their hottest time. The river had the highest bacteria load, and their chlorinator was not up to the task. Uh, it was not a large enough contact system, so they had to use high amounts of chlorine. Um, and when they weren't using high enough, they got these uh, high coliform counts. So twice in August to 2014, they issued separate boil water advisories. Now that's a lot, and it's a whole lot for uh, an issue at the treatment plant. You'll see it with some frequency caused by broken water mains, because as we, we talked about last time, or last week, you know, if, we, if a water main breaks, bacteria and contamination can get in the line, right? And, and we use the, the example from Nicaragua where <laughs> We saw it in, in, in real time, right, with a small pipe uh, that, that burst. But if it's a big water main, then, you know, we, like, we normally pressurize our system to push water out. If there is any small leak, but a water main break, then it just kind of floods into the system. And until we flush that out, the water is not safe to drink, right? So um, in this case, this was caused by a failure at the treatment plant, which is quite rare in comparison. Um, and that was really uh, pretty unacceptable because it should be designed sufficiently, right? This is a design problem at, at that level. All right, so that happened twice, so they kept adding more chlorine, and so therefore they had these disinfe disinfection byproducts start forming. Um, too many trihalomethanes were detected, and so they were um, faulted for that as well. Uh, so they really were in a... a difficult spot because the, the design was not properly in place. They, they did not have adequate um, treatment facilities to, to do what they were trying to do um, at that point. Also in August, the city officials were telling residents, barring the moments when they had boil water advisories, uh, the water is safe to drink. Literally, they were telling residents that and accusing residents of being conspiratorial and all of this. And they were ordering crates of bottled water for their city office so that they didn't have to drink the water. <laughs> so 
talk about hypocritical and awful. Um, mm -hmm. That was that was the situation. So the lot and I'll I'll add a caveat here. So barring the times where there was high counts of coliforms or trihalomethanes, outside of that, technically the water they were distributing out of the plant should have been safe. Now they probably were not meeting the aesthetic standards we talked about, right? The uh, the non health related stuff, color, odor, it can, your, your water can technically be brown in color, but safe to drink, right? That, that's possible. Um, we do it all the time if you think about coffee or tea, right? Um, okay, but people don't want that coming out of their tap. And as the, the people suspected, that was an indicator that something bigger was wrong. Because the thing is, despite the fact that it was coming out of the, the plant safe, in, in a safe form, it was leaching uh, the lead off the pipes, and that was a, obviously making it not safe by the time it got to homeowners' taps in many cases. Okay, by December 2014, trying to fix these things, the city of Flint had already spent $4 million on water treatment plant upgrades, and they had not even really invested yet into this, uh, this uh, different pipeline that they were originally trying to do. So this emergency manager, you know, looking to save, save a buck, save $5 million, that, and that's, that's a fair amount, um, over some amount of years, they already had to spend $4 million on a treatment system that they were poisoning their residents with. So they had, by, by that December, they were almost already in the negative in terms of what they, they wanted to do. Right. Um, and so at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, well, you know, Detroit might be to blame because like, hey, they they kind of pulled out the rug from underneath them. Maybe if they'd kept them for two years or something, that would have been better. Um, so coming into January 2015, well, Detroit, I would say, or the, the water, Detroit Water and Sewerage at, redeems themselves a bit um, and offers a you know, they see that Flint's really struggling and they offer to reconnect and waive the fee. Now, that might sound like, oh good, they don't have to pay 20 bucks. No, this is, this is a fee that means they're waiving all of the engineering costs to uh, plan, excavate, install, change, like the, the amount of work that needs to be done to overhaul a distribution system to connect or disconnect an entire segment that's pretty significant, and that would probably include, well, how, how much water are they treating from their treatment plan in the first place and redesigning, recalibrating their dosages and, and all of that. So that's actually quite a lot of money. Um, so large engineering fees um, would be involved here in costs. Uh, so that's, in my perspective, that's not trivial. Right, so that, you know, perhaps they were a part of the instigating the, the crisis, but at least they offered to um, help fix it as soon as it was very apparent that there was a big problem. Uh, but that same month, the emergency manager for Flint uh, rejects that offer uh, just outright. It's like, nope, we don't want you. We don't need you. We're fine. Um, right. Uh, in March 2015, the city council of Flint is so upset, and this is before the public knows, before anybody really knows that poisoning is happening, by the way. That's not known yet. It's What's known is that the water's nasty, and people don't like to use it, people don't like to bathe in it, people don't like to drink it, but that's what they have, and they've been told repeatedly that, no, it's safe. And by metrics coming out of the water treatment plant, it looked safe. Um, had they, uh, again, recognized the lack of corrosion control, they'd realize it was not going to stay safe. Uh, so the city council of Flint votes unanimously to reconnect, but of course this emergency manager, and by the way, there was between the 2010 and 2017 or something like that, there was about eight different emergency managers, and some, some were repeats. They would, one would be appointed and be there for a year, and then somebody else would and then maybe that same guy would come back. And so it was not, um, not a good situation for continuity. And 
um, you know, we, we could go and dig and find the exact person here making these uh, awful decisions, but um, I don't have the, the names right now. Okay, um, so by mid-2015, here's where uh, the story blows up. Um, and by the way, I, I moved to Michigan in October 2014. So I, I had no idea some of this stuff was going on. And actually, uh, just as a little timeline, so if I graduated from grad school in August, by January, I decided, well, my student loans are coming due soon, so I picked up a, a job for, a, uh, I was a math tutor or like a just generic science math tutor for a little bit. And then by February, I, um, actually it was January. Um, so sometime in January or February, I ended up getting a job at Michigan's Department of Environmental Quality. Now, thankfully, I didn't manage to find my way, way into the water treatment side of things, but the wastewater. So I was a wastewater permit writer, um, which was actually very nice because my career has sort of shifted to, to not just be like the drinking water side. That was the first ex real exposure to, hey, what's, what's wastewater about and has, has been a, a great part of um, my career since. So anyhow, uh, by mid-2015, kind of the summer, uh, some pediatricians started noticing that children had um, really high levels of lead in their blood. And this was startling. This was an obvious, massive concern. Lead poisoning um, is serious. It's lifelong. It's uh, permanent brain damage, essentially, uh, is, is what we expect. Um, and so one of them contacts uh, Mark Edwards from uh, Virginia Tech, who is um, was known in part uh, for dealing with some water distribution system issues in Washington, D.C. Um, so he had some, some track record, as, as I understand it, for dealing with this type of stuff. Okay, October 2015, Flint finally switches back to the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department. So um, if this was uh, highlighted maybe in June or something, uh, months later, they finally make the decision, right? And so it was, you, you can look at this in, um, as perhaps a, an effective and um, really helpful citizen activism, uh, getting um, professionals involved and all of that, but it still, it took months, right? And that, that was um, pretty, pretty terrible that it took so long. Um, so that essentially, as soon as that switch happened, corrosion control was reintroduced. And so even though nothing was done about the lead pipes in that moment, the problem, the source of the problem would be essentially fixed. Now, I'm sure that there was a little bit of water left in the system that was corrosive and still some particles hanging out from having been corroded. Um, but as soon as the corrosion controls there, flushing through the system, that was a real big benefit. Um, one of the things I didn't mention, by the way, and I'll mention it now, the, the situation of many vacant homes was still persistent during this time. Flint, Michigan has been economically depressed for decades. So there's still many vacant homes. And one of the key things about that with relevance to the water system is that essentially you have a lot of stagnant water in the distribution system. So the water age, we talk about how long our chlorine is going to last in the system. Um, we don't like to have water age above some uh, threshold, or if it's going to stay for some amount of time, we usually have a, a chlorine dosing station that's going to re-up it um, and essentially refresh the, the water in that sense. Um, so water age has been a, has, was a, a um, an issue here because it would just stay stagnant and with the corrosive um, properties, that was no good at all. Okay, by January 2016, the, the governor admits that there, hey, there's also been this Legionnaire's disease outbreak. Um, my wife had, was uh, doing kind of an internship type of a fellowship thing, and she was actually working on some of this. So I'm going to have a, a sep second part of this uh, presentation today to, to describe 
uh, just that. Um, essentially, that was going on in 2014 and 2015, and ultimately it was related back to the switch to the Flint River. Also has to do with this water age. Legionella um, is a commonly occurring bacteria in the environment, and it can grow in our, um, in our water systems, but it's, you know, chlorine usually keeps it at bay unless there's some issues with the, the chlorine or the, the handling of a, maybe a, a hospital has its own water system. Um, and the fact that um, the in, incoming water was not so good actually caused some problems for, for a hospital. Okay, uh, by February 2017, uh, the CDC linked the Flint water to this Legionnaire's outbreak. That was pretty significant because there was some drama even trying to get it linked. We'll talk about in a minute. Um, and since then, uh, there's, there's been a lot going on. I haven't tracked it with it super closely, but legally, uh, former Governor Snyder, eight other officials were charged with 34 felonies, two misdemeanors, two official, officials charged with involuntary manslaughter. Now, the, I don't think the lead directly killed anybody, um, although it, I'm guessing it would have decreased some people's life, expected lifespans. Um, but the Legionnaires disease did kill people. Um, it's a, basically, it's like a severe case of pneumonia. And so if you are immunocompromised or elderly, uh, it, it can be a, a cause of death. Um, now, my last look at the, the legal outfall, it does look like there was some, um, there was something to do with a grand jury of one person was, was uh, Michigan was using a grand jury of one to do some of these convictions or, or something. And they're saying, hey, that's probably not right. So it's affecting some of these or maybe they're being revisited. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's almost 10 years ago now and it, it stuff is still happening. So hopefully, hopefully justice is served. I, there was, as you could see, a lot of injustice here. A lot, lot of that was related to a state-appointed manager saying, hey, I know better, when really, no, it's a very bad situation, very difficult situation, but the, uh, the appointed emergency manager uh, did not, in the end, know better. Okay, so uh, to kind of summarize a little bit and, and show another one of these um, pictures here, so this was tap water on the left during the, uh, the Flint River and a year or two later from the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department. And we can say, we can take a look here. Um, in 2015, it had no corrosion control. Here there was above three ppm of phosphate um, on in the this clearly better water. They had uh, 19 parts per billion of iron in cold water, uh, no detection of Legionella, no detectable pneumonia, uh, pneumonophilia. In, the, in this uh, Flint water, they had um, no corrosion control, uh, 32 parts per billion of iron in cold water. So that was parts per billion on the, both sides. So 32 um, counts of iron compared to 19. Um, they had 1,500 gene copies of Legionella species, 100 copies of this pneumonophilia species, per, and that's per milliliter. So quite, quite a big difference there, um, clear, clear issues. Again, I definitely encourage you to check these uh, papers out. I will, um, if they're not already there, I will add the links or, or post them to Moodle um, for you. Um, there's two different papers in particular. Okay, so the, the failures overall, just to summarize, the lack of corrosion control, huge, and would have been such a, a cheap, an effective um, solution. Since, since the Flint water crisis, the, um, the city of Flint has been going through, uh, I think with lots of federal money and replacing lead pipes. And I think they, they believe they've got all the pipes replaced, um, but we still want corrosion control, <laughs> right? That at least if we were to have a situation with no corrosion control, there wouldn't be an immediate lead problem there. But corrosion control is the issue, right? 
we actually don't ever want our water to be corroding the pipes. So as, as we think about from last week, the lecture is talking about what makes water corrosive, like what's the equilibrium between a precipitation reaction or a, a dissolution reaction. This type of principle, we actually want our water to always be slightly in a range of where stuff will precipitate. So we would like for our pipes to be constricted by mineral deposits slowly over time. And we want that compared to etching away the metal uh, or etching away the pipe material over time because that would lead to pipes breaking and water, groundwater entering and, and all of that. Whereas constricting, it will just naturally will have to replace it someday, right? That's a, a much better, um, it's, it's kind of like the, the lesser of two evils in a way, but um, if it takes 100 years before the, <laughs> the deposits are so, so much that um, the water is completely restricted, that's just simply better than uh, having, having corrosion. Okay, uh, the other aspect of that was the inadequate treatment capacity at the Flint uh, water treatment plant. Um, adding a whole bunch of extra chlorine is also probably not conducive to having, um, you know, to avoiding high, highly corrosive water. Um, so that excessive chlorination was an issue. Um, the Flint River itself was simply rather corrosive. Um, and then the, the many vacant homes added a, a, a big issue challenge with the water age. Um, so exacerbating the, the lead and the Legionnaire's uh, potential here. Okay. All right. So let's talk about this Legionnaire's disease or Legionellosis. Um, and this was, uh, again, my, um, my wife was doing a, um, a fellowship at MDHHS. And so this was actually some of her slides and some of the stuff that she, she was working on at the time. So Legionella, Legionella um, I mentioned it's a bacteria, can give you pneumonia. It's uh, pretty um, bad for uh, older people, but it's actually not known to be transmittable from person to person contact. Um, so even if you're sneezing and gross and all that, um, you really have to inhale um, uh, a fair amount of, um, it's, it's typical, it's typically, um, the typical exposure is something like a water treatment tower that is spraying um, aerosolized water droplets. Um, now, I guess maybe from a sneeze, it just hasn't been documented, hasn't been a known uh, to be trans transmitted that way, and perhaps where it infects or how it infects in a person that just doesn't is not conducive to being um, excreted with a sneeze or whatever. So maybe it's a, sort of a deeper thing, um, but it's it's usually like shower water, where it's spraying and it's in the system, or um, or like a a water tower or something like that that has active um, growth of Legionella. Um, that's how you would be exposed and, and get it. So it's actually not person to person. So when you're tracking it, then it uh, becomes pretty interesting um, how, you, how you manage that. Okay, I'm sorry for the old notes here. Um, so the way we track diseases um, is pretty interesting. So if you take a look at what we would call surveillance, public health surveillance, the deal is um, there are certain diseases that we want to um, spy on sur surveillance right we're survey or we're surveilling the, the stuff um, we want to track them to see where they are who's getting it why it's happening um, and so let's say you're exposed to some disease and you get an illness and you if you go see a doctor or a physician then you're going to have a chance of having this disease be diagnosed and then um, if this is a what we call a reportable disease, something like Legionnaire's disease, um, for a long time we were trying to have um, COVID as reportable. I don't think that was very, you know, effective, especially as it became endemic and it became something that was, uh, for most people, not not necessarily um, able to be distinguished from a, a cold. 
you know, you, you might or might not know it. Um, the, uh, the reporting here may be something like HIV AIDS, cryptosporidium, some of the, the more unique or more specific, like, hey, here's this problem. Um, if, if people are having this, we want to know because maybe we can do something about it. Um, so there are, there's a list of reportable diseases. Um, and so if you have a reportable disease, the flu, by the way, is not reportable. We just estimated that. Um, and I, the whole, again, the whole COVID thing uh, screwed up our estimations because what used to be attributed to flu, all these cases of respiratory things, you know, um, it just sort of sucked away the energy out of any flu uh, estimations. Um, okay, so then uh, the physician will say, I think you've got this. Let's send this off to a laboratory. Uh, let's test it, or maybe they can test it in-house. So then they would communicate that. Um, either that would just go straight to a laboratory who would then communicate that to the local health department and probably the state health department, or maybe they just um, go directly to the local health department. Um, regardless, there's, there's electronic systems in place here to say, oh, here's this disease. We had a positive diagnosis. Now we have a case. Here's some info that's tagged with this case. This person is so-and-so, obviously protected medical records. Um, and here's the, the age, the, uh, the sex, all, all of these things. Okay, what's going on here? So in the case of the Legionnaire's disease, it is, um, they do have a surveillance system for it. Um, and what should have happened was the local health department in Genesee County, which is um, where Flint was, and Apparently, Genesee County used to be really well known for high quality um, local health department. Um, but by this point, they were not so known for that. So what happened is they should have collected this data. There was illnesses, Legionnaire's disease illnesses showing up um, in much higher numbers than normal, as we'll see. Um, what they should have done is taken DNA samples to say, hey, let's get a record of the DNA for this Legionnaire, Legionella um, so that we could potentially match it with somebody else. Now, um, at that time, the health department was telling them, hey, you need to do this. The state health department was, hey, you need to do this. Um, you should be taking DNA samples and they were refusing to do so. Um, and it just seemed like incompetence um, or maybe some sort of a, uh, a, a grudge match against the state. And I'm a little sympathetic given how, <laughs> how the state as a whole was treating <laughs> the, the county and the city for the, the emergency managers, but still this is, you know, that's not exactly the same context. And this is the health department really was trying to, the state health department was trying to get them to do the right thing so that they could connect it with the Flint River water if that was the case, right? That, this was a necessary step. and. This was happening with Legionella, uh, Legionella really in 2014, because that's when the switch happened, and 2015, um, summer in the summers. And we can see that here. Um, this is the, the historic data up to uh, the beginning of 2015. And it's typical, the disease is, as I mentioned, the organism is um, in the environment. Um, and I think it was first called Pontiac fever for because it was found in Pontiac, Michigan. So it's common up there in particular. And in the summertime, you have a few cases um, just about every year, um, maybe a couple cases in a month. Um, but in 2014, the, those case numbers skyrocketed to, you know, five to 10 cases a month um, in the summer of 2014, uh, coinciding quite, um, quite well with the uh, switch to the Flint water crate, the Flint water, which was right here. Uh, so we saw a, a big spike there, and the following year, we kind of had the same type of deal um, if we were to, to dig up that data as well. Okay, so a couple other things about this. Um, and again, I, I meant to go back and purge the old notes, but here we are. Um, so there was essentially, these, these cases were primarily diagnosed in the context of two different hospitals. Uh, it was Hospital A and Hospital B. And so there was some question about, 
Is it the hospital exposures that's a problem? Is it the Flint River water? Is it where people are getting their water? Um, what's the deal here? Uh, and there's a lot of drama about this for, for some time. Um, and in fact, uh, I had some insider knowledge that we were pretty sure this was uh, Hospital A or whichever one was a problem. And that was McLaren Hospital. And there was no way in the world that anybody should ever say that, <laughs> say what I just said. It's come out in lawsuits later that yes, in fact, that's true. And in fact, the deal was there were some higher ups in Mc the ownership of McLaren Hospital and the MDHHS that were saying, no, don't say anything about it. So corruption, 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 corruption. Um, I think from what I hear, Louisiana is worse, but definitely Michigan had some corruption too. <laughs> okay, so Hospital A then, um, and this, uh, this report here, you could look at this article, I think was still under the uh, expectation of keeping it as Hospital A and B. Um, if we take a look at the data here, what we're seeing is the red blocks are Hospital A exposure. This would be the number of cases here. Um, and I think this is the 2014 and 2015 um, peaks. Yeah, that, yeah, right down here. Um, and so the, the red blocks are Hospital A exposure. The blue blocks are resin on Flint water. Um, the gray is neither. Uh, so it's uh, maybe some, some confusion. It might not just be that. Uh, might might be a, around elsewhere. Um, and then if we take a look here, this, this block or this uh, graph on the upper right, um, this is describing essentially when McLaren Hospital decided to add extra chlorine and then eventually do what they're really supposed to do is heat and chlorine their, their system. Because hospitals often maintain their own water system. They'll get the water supply and then they have to you know, have special water for some applications. So they should have some of their own treatment and ma maintenance. But that also means they're, they're responsible for managing that system well. And that's, that was the failing. They had not, and probably triggered by the switch to Flint River water where there was more counts of Legionella coming in. Um, there, so there was a combined problem here of they have a, a worse water supply now, and then they were not properly maintaining, even though they were seeing they had cases, um, and I think they, they knew um, that they, they needed it. So uh, we can see that when they did extra chlorine in their system, that, that seemed to help. Uh, and then when they did the a heat plus chlorine, chlorine treatment and um, also adding chloramine into their system to make sure there was a residual, a, a good uh, long-lasting residual in there, then they really uh, cut the cases down. Um, and this would have been, if we, if we take a look, that's kind of two blocks away. This is, I think, matching right here. And that would be that's also coinciding with right around the time, I think uh, right here would be where the, the, the city of Flint switched back to the Detroit water. So they fixed their issues finally after the two years of killing people here, because some of these people died, right? That's, that's the involuntary manslaughter charges. Um, and not doing their job, finally got around to it and the, and the source water was, was fixed. Okay, so another, another thing just kind of showing that spread, um, we have superheating with hi hyperchlorination, that's these events here, um, and you can see those corresponded to um, drops in, uh, significant drops in positive samples, so percentage of samples taken in their system that were positive for Legionnaires or Legionella, um, and the concentration of colony forming units per liter also dropping. So you can see they, they did some effort. They did some extra chlorination, these bl black lines. Uh, this time it didn't even seem to help much. Um, and then they did uh, this superheating plus hyperchlorination that helped. And then they added the um, monochloramine unit to, to help keep things, um, keep it clean for longer. Okay, sorting out who was really responsible? 
this was kind of some of the data we saw just uh, as a um, kind of in a table form. They were, what the different things they were looking through were, okay, who's on the city of Flint water, who's on the um, township water, who's on private wells, who's not known. And these are of the 45 cases of Legionella, um, Legionellosis that were, were found. So it was not 100% clear. Um, so it, in part, I think it was just, there's a lot of Legionella out there um, given the river water. Um, but certainly Hospital A, uh, McLaren, um, was also largely um, faulted by, by this and, um, and rightly so for, for being a major part of the problem. Um, here's a little more data on that hospital A versus no hospital A. You can see the, uh, the green showing a lot of these cases were, um, were associated. And this was the 2015 data. Okay, uh, any questions? <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, when, we, when we make everything a business, it's, there's, there's a lot of room for, what would you say, for unethical practice, right? But at the same time, a lot of this is bureaucracy at a problem too, right? So it's, and, and maybe that's part of what the, the issue with business is, is how big the business is, right? It's hard. Especially um, with hospitals, you have that as a ER doctor. Mm. And he was working, there's many hospitals that it got bought out by some private companies and they had all the doctors come in and they were saying, basically he's saying they keep their cust or their patients as customers and they want their patients to be like leaving the hospital like happy. And then he's like, I don't think they're happy or not. Like they're doing service or whatever they're owed to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can even think of universities that way, in a sense, right? It's like, um, how m <laughs> I was looking at some emails just the other day about, uh, you know, Office of Affordable Education Resources. Sounds great, but how much are we paying salaries for people to run that office and making the education less affordable? <laughs> it's like, it's, it can get so backwards. <laughs> it's like, well, Maybe maybe tuition is not, you know. Maybe we should lower the tuition instead of. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, this is, if if you look at the uh, administration costs versus like tuition costs versus like faculty salary stuff, it's like administrative costs are the, and which is also partly a fault of the governance in in the sense that we have all these new rules and regulations that we're supposed to follow and. People have problems and people systems have problems, I guess. Yeah. Do you have a time that you think Yeah, the uh, emergency managers, I don't know what the prerequisites were. It might have been just like a good businessman. I think it was really up to the, the governor's office to say, hey, this person seems capable. So definitely not, not uh, the, did not have the prerequisites to understand anything about a water treatment system. Right, um, so definitely lacking in uh, lacking in competence in some some key areas. Yeah, I, I think some of them were in pretty big trouble. So I think that might some of them might have been jailed. I hope so. Would would make sense to me for the involuntary manslaughter charges to go against the emergency managers. I don't know. Not, not, not for me to judge, and I'm happy about that. <laughs> Wait, whenever you said a grand jury of one, did you mean one person? One person. How is that grand? I, I think the definition of a grand jury is, is like it's not, uh, it's not the amount. It's like the, I don't know. It's like something, it, it's different than a no, normal jury. I don't, I don't know. But I was I was reading it last night and I was like, huh. So some of the legal stuff, you know, it it's also not right to just like point a finger at somebody who looks like they're the problem and just say, 
you're the problem, you're the scapegoat, right? So we want real justice, which requires, does require a lot of time and investigation and stuff. And also requires us not to be so corrupt as to say, don't you dare say the name of McLaren Hospital, you know? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Th there's a, a part of it that I I understand because activism can be weaponized and if the landfill operators are really trying to do what they need to do and sometimes they something comes out or maybe they didn't know and then suddenly some student comes in and, and then some activist blows up and gives them a really awful year and they go are like struggling with them with bankruptcy and can't do the treatment or you know like it could go badly right so I part of me gets that but yeah Yeah. Yeah. So there, there are, there, there was one specific update to the rules that, that was more, more clarification, but also a little bit more certainty that what's going to happen is is done properly. And that's that's with regards to how we sample um, water from different taps in the in a distribution system. So there was the, the lead and copper rule had some definition of, oh, you need to check this number of taps at different houses, restaurants, different places. And you, there were actually some requirements to discard specific statistical outliers. And when this came up, people became really worried that that system was not being done properly. Why are you discarding this high lead data? how dare you, like this, this is terribly wrong. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but my impression was that it was actually done correctly, but the, the rules in place were either unclear or not sufficient to recognize that, hey, those outliers were actually really important. So the, I know that there was an update to the lead and copper rule in terms of testing, tap testing in the, in the community. Um, at the, the Big picture though is the, um, the corrosion control is a requirement. It, so the violation of not having it was a, a massive failing. So that, that rule was already in place, it should have protected. And, and so I, I would hope that maybe there's some more emphasis, <laughs> more people will be like, oh, we need to check that. <laughs> Yeah, it's, that's a great question. So the, the regulation structure is we have the EPA at the federal level. They send requirements, like you must do these things and you must report these things, you must stu you know, study or make sure of these things. And then usually that, that set of requirements is then delegated to the state departments um, for, for the most part. So then the, the Michigan's Department of Environmental Quality Again, thankfully, I didn't work for that part. <laughs> um, so the Office of Drinking Water. Um, they are then accountable to the EPA um, and should be making sure that everybody in the state is measuring. And so they'll have some requirement. You must have a certified study or, or a sample laboratory with a stamp and the approval that yes, this had zero lead, or yes, this had this number of coliforms. So the, 
the um, typical um, pathway is between the municipality and the state level, but then the state level is getting its, its overall requirements from the EPA. Yeah, that's a that's very interesting. Uh, I think we have access to it. At, at minimum, we could do what we call a Freedom of Information Act and get that data. I'm confident we could do that. So if somebody's concerned, they can they can get the data. Um, might be hard to find it otherwise, but we know that at least the regulations are supposed to meet, and the pub, it would be public knowledge if there's a violation. But there's an interesting question there about uh, you know we we hear a lot lately about the uh, the current. Um, concern with the PFOA, PFAS, all that, the perfluorinated um, stuff. Well, what happens if we can detect a, a toxin down to the, the femtogram per liter level? Okay. Can, we, can we look at a, a femtogram of uh, you know, pesticide in our water? Do we care? We're, we're exposed to contamination. And here again, the, the, uh, the journalists who don't know better can, can say, oh no, you know, we're all gonna die. It's toxic, it's, you know, It'd be great water. <laughs> it only had that. <laughs> so the, the dose makes the poison, right? I, uh, And I think another another funny aspect is people that that assume the water the the bottled water is better um, probably don't realize that the most cost effective thing for a, a, a bottling company to do is to take water from a water treatment plant, dechlorinate it, and put it in the bottle. <laughs> and in fact, uh, Dasani, which is Coca Cola's uh, water bottling company, in in Atlanta, they take it straight from the Gwinnett County uh, water treatment plant, which is a, it is a fancy water treatment plant, it does advanced oxidation and all sorts of good stuff. But they take that water, dechlorinate it, and then they're good, <laughs> that's it. And so then what you end up with is, on average, in a bottled water, maybe there's like, you know, one to five colon colony forming units in there, you might count, whereas like in, in tap water, you'd have like, zero to one <laughs> per bottle or something like that. It's like the, uh, you, you'll have maybe a little more risk because you're not chlorinating or you've taken the residual chlorine out. So it's, uh, it's funny. But, and it's, uh, you know, there, there's something really uh, valuable about citizens being equipped to know something about it. Like in Michigan here, that is really citizen activism that, that brought the, the issue forward um, but at the flip side, uh, you know, it's understandable that you may not know that, you know, uh, 
the bottled water is not necessarily different, right? <laughs> it's very, very interesting. Help, helps, uh, I think, says something good about our uh, having, having education about it. So go tell your friends. All right, well, thank you. Like I said, I'll try to get a, a homework posted for you um, tonight or tomorrow. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll come back to advanced oxidation processes on, uh, on Tuesday. Okay, so thanks, and we'll, uh, we'll see you then.